Hi, and welcome to episode 33 of the Breaking Bio podcast. I'm Morgan Jackson. I'm a PhD student at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada. And today we've got a full cast of people here to talk to us about uh, all sorts of interesting things, starting with Bug. Hi, I'm Bug Girl. I'm speaking to you from my lair in northern Ohio. Hi, I'm Rafael Maya, PhD student at the University of Akron, also Ohio. Hi, I'm Stephen Hamlin, postdoc at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. Hi, I'm Tom Housley, a PhD student at the University of Stirling in Scotland. And today our very special guest is none other than science writer and uh, freelance writer as well as book writer, uh, Brian Swiatek. Well, hi everyone, and yes, as I've just been introduced, I am a writer. I'm based out of uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, and uh, I'm also a, a volunteer with the Paleontology Department at the Natural Museum of Utah. Awesome. So we've actually got a real live dinosaur hunter with us today. That's right. I'm just back fresh from the field, in, in, in fact. Awesome. Still covered in mud? Uh, not totally. There's always a little bit. That, like, it's, it's plaster more than anything else. You know, plaster on the nail beds it takes a long time to uh, come off. But uh, yeah, I, I have showered and, and, and taken care of myself since then. <laughs> um, it was actually quite cushy in the first camp I went to. So the um, first place I went uh, digging for dinosaurs this past week was uh, in a town called Hanksville in eastern Utah. So it's near like the Canyonlands National Park uh, mm -hmm. area, about two hours from Moab, Utah, and uh, working this Jurassic bone bed. So about 150 million years old, this sort of just mm -hmm. massive conglomeration of uh, sauropod dinosaurs. But the crew that I was rolling with in the Burpee Museum in uh, Rockford, Illinois, they, uh, they, they rolled pretty lavishly. Uh, the campground that they're staying at, they're actually you know, sh warm showers and there's a, you know, like a restaurant and stuff like right at the front of the campground. So you know, I'm used to just you know, pack in, pack out, take your tent and everything you need. And uh, you know, it was like staying in a hotel you know, for, for, for me. <laughs> you go to some bad hotels. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably superior to some I've been in, that's true. <laughs> so, so what how were you was... looking for? So this is a particular quarry that was uh, locals knew about for a long time, um, since the 1930s or so. You know, people would find bits of bone and the, uh, they'd take them home or give them to friends and stuff. Um, but it was only um, worked sort of consistently since 2007. So there are notes about this place for a while. Um, but since 2007, the Burpee Museum has been working the site, and it's the equivalent of a place like Dinosaur National Monument or some of these other Jurassic bone beds where it's just chock full of sauropod dinosaurs. So things like Apatosaurus and Camarasaurus, these long-necked, heavy-bodied, long-tailed dinosaurs. But the thing is that they're all juveniles, or at least most of them are juveniles. So it's just all their disarticulated bones all sort of mashed on top of each other. So when I started, you know, my assignment was, you know, see that little knob on that hill there, take a broom and brush all the dust off from the previous season. And as soon as I brush it off, there's bone coming out of the ground. It looks to be a rib. It's really weathered. It's really cracked. It's not in really great shape, but it's b dinosaur bone nonetheless. So I try and take that out. As I'm trying to take that out, I find more bone to the side of it. And as you're doing this, you have to go around, you make a little pedestal. So you, you know, go close to the bone, but still leave some rock to keep it together. You pedestal it down, go underneath so you can put a jacket on it, and then pop it off. Uh, so I found another bit of bone. As I'm trying to get that out, I find more. I didn't take anything out a whole week because it's all these little fragile little thin bones are all sort of interfingered with each other. Um, you know, looks to be parts of sort of the neck vertebrae or, you know, other really fragile sorts of bones, and that's the way it goes. And, you know, on the other hill, people are finding limb bones or the back of a skull or, you know, uh, you know, teeth uh, that have been shed from these dinosaurs. So it seemed to be this... Um, 150 million year old channel deposit. So this is like an ancient floodplain covered with ferns and sort of stands of conifers. Um, something happened, we don't know exactly what, that uh, you know, these dinosaurs might have died in a drought and all their bones or over various seasons got all washed together and uh, tangled up in a channel about 10 feet deep. And you can see the cross section through and just see bone coming out all the way through the section. And uh, yeah, it's an absolutely fascinating place to work. And to give you an idea of uh, the landscape, the um, Hanksville sort of Mars Exploration Center is right there. So they have like an artificial Mars habitat, like a greenhouse and a place where people stay for like weeks at a time. They go out in their suits and they do rover races. Basically, like just a couple of miles from the entrance. So it's like digging dinosaurs on Mars, pretty much. So, you know, they of, of all the places to pick, these people picked, you know, the site right outside this quarry to be, uh, you know, sort of a Mars proxy. In fact, in the next valley over, uh, parts of John Carter of Mars were filmed right there, and they found <laughs> dinosaurs at the site. 
So it's a really sort of otherworldly landscape to be working in. So when you're, you're, you're out there and you're dusting and you find a bone, how hard is it to not go, Wah! because I would, have, I would have a really hard time not running around just going, oh, my God. Um. <laughs> so that's, that's the first one. That's usually the first bone, or, and, and often the second one. But after that, it's like, oh, fuck, another vertebra. It's you know, cause you're trying to get one, you're trying to get the bone out and then there's, you know, just, there's more around it. So you can't pop that one out without uncovering more. So it becomes, you're excited, but also incredibly frustrated because you just want to get your one project done and cataloged and stored. And instead it's like, well, I guess I'll have to come back next year and, and, you know, <laughs> figure this out, you know, more, I mean, especially some of these bones where, you know, there'll be a really thin one on top and something will be diving underneath and something else will be on top of that. And you can't, be sure even what belongs to what, because you don't fully clean these bones in, in the field. You want to leave a little bit of rock around them so they're still stabilized. So it just becomes this tangled mess of stuff where it's exciting, but at the same time incredibly sort of frustrating. Well, the thing I was most excited about, um, so I was in the Hanksville Quarry for about six days, and then I went to another site about two hours away uh, called the Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry. And this is also in eastern Utah. It's uh, on the way to, to Arches National Monument. It's uh, another one of these same age Jurassic bone bed over 46 minimum individuals of uh, Allosaurus have been found here, probably many, many more. But it's this, um, you know, a very similar site, another, you know, bone bed where everything's all, you know, chaotic, but dominated by predators instead of herbivores. No one really knows why. Uh, so they have these two buildings that they built over parts of this deposit. So working the buildings is nice to be in the shade, you know, away from the gnats, um, and just, you know, scraping away, trying to dig this stuff up. And I found uh, a tooth about the size of my thumbnail. And this wasn't from a predatory dinosaur, but from an, herbiv an herbivorous dinosaur that's relatively rare. And it's huge for the size of, of the typical size of what we thought this dinosaur was, something called Camptosaurus. So if you know Iguanodon from you know, the old dinosaur books, one of these sort of bipedal dinosaurs with the thumb spikes and sort of the long beaky snout. Um, most animals that, you know, or most reconstructions that you see will be about 20 feet long or so. Uh, really, really tiny teeth. This tooth suggests an animal with a skull maybe three or four feet long, so really a giant for for its sort. So it's just that one little tidbit is suggesting something that hasn't ever really been seen before. And that to me is very, very exciting. But, you know, it, it's sort of a combination of uh, excitement and tedium <laughs> at, at the same time. <laughs> because, you know, you'll, you'll find a whole bunch of stuff and you'll be scraping away and then not find anything else for hours and then you'll come up with something else. But in those hours when you're not finding every, anything, you, you, I get into this kind of like trance or just scrape, 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 brush, brush, brush. But I always have to be on the lookout for, you know, a glint of enamel, a bit of bone picking out. Like even though it's very easy to stop paying attention, you know, one wrong move and you can bust right through a, a skull bone. So it's almost like a zen-like state that's required at some point to pay attention while not losing your mind on just scraping away. Yeah. You ever hear a very loud, oh shit, from somewhere in the Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've heard stories where someone, uh, they, they had a fossil they wanted to get out. And, uh, you know, I didn't see this happen personally, but I was told the story by a paleontologist by the name of Tim Rowe, where, uh, you know, they knew they had dinosaur bones and wanted to take a rock saw to cut around some of this really hard sandstone to get it out. Revved up the rock saw, plunged it into the rock, and there's this shower of teeth and bone <laughs> fragments. It stuck it right into an Allosaurus skull and didn't even, they didn't even know it was there. Uh, so, you know, thankfully there's always the hope of finding a little bit more. But, uh, what we call a discovery marks are, are quite common. We don't have accidents. We make discovery marks. <laughs> <laughs> they don't put that on the sign at the museum, do they? No, not usually. If you go to <laughs> conferences and stuff, though, you'll just see, you know, uh, there's one, I think, in Pittsburgh uh, in 2010. Uh, there was a, a dinosaur that since was named uh, Daemonosaurus, so mostly known for this really snaggly toothed little skull. And when uh, the paleontologist put the image of this on the screen, there are two large round holes in the jaw, and you just have this exasperated look. It's like, yeah, and that's where the lab preparator drove his air scribe right into the skull. And it's just like, and there's nothing you can do about it. You know, this is a new species never seen before and stuff, and the person who uncovered it, it's like, so we gave the specimen to someone else and continued preparation. But yeah, I mean, breaks and, um, you know, uh, minor damage happen, you know, quite often. You hope that they don't, but it's sort of, you know, unavoidable when you're just, you know, digging into uh, rock where you don't entirely know what's, what's there. And often the bones are broken themselves. It's not, they're all, they're not all uh, nicely together and, and clean. Uh, we had uh, at the Cleveland Lloyd Quarry, uh, the femora of Allosaurus, so two um, 
femurs or femur bones right next to each other. And these are, you know, relatively stout bones from large animals. You figure they'd stay together relatively nicely. Just cracks all the way through. I mean, they're a fresh break, so we can glue those together and put the whole thing back very nicely. But, I mean, uh, it's not like Jurassic Park where you just brush it off and like, oh, look, a perfect skeleton that we can just, you know, throw in the back seat and take home. That, that doesn't happen. <laughs> So you guys must come up with a lot of bones out of these, or for somebody who thinks that dinosaur bones are, are fairly rare, it seems like they're very locally uh, common. So once you come out of a field like this and you've got your meticulous packaging done and your fingers encased in plaster, where do all these bones end up? Well, hopefully uh, in a uh, public institution like a museum or university, uh, they'll often go into uh, either straight into the lab if there's something important. So uh, many museums and universities have, have prep labs where they rely on volunteers, um, such as myself and, and others, because usually it's very minimum staff, on volunteers to uh, you know clean up these bones, get them ready for study and for display. Uh, oftentimes large blocks are stuff that just, uh, you know, there's no room to have you know, worked on right now, it will go into storage. I mean, there are some plaster jackets that were collected, um, you know, in the 19th century that were collected in the heyday of the Bone Wars between, you know, Edward Drinker Cope and Othniel Charles Marsh that still have not been opened or worked on. You know, more is usually collected than is ever, you know, um, you know finished, especially within a short span of time. Um, but the fortunate thing is if these are in public institutions, someone can come along and say, hey, I want to study that. Can you get a loan for that? Could you have someone prep that? Can someone, you know, do something with it, whereas uh, you know, with some discoveries on private land, on ranches and stuff, those might go to you know um, a, a special uh, place that just is basically a business that specializes in lab prep. You know, gets the bones nice and pretty, and then those will go you know up for sale to whatever museum. There's an example of. Um, must be called the dueling dinosaurs. So what is actually a, a juvenile Tyrannosaurus rex and what seems to be an older pathological Triceratops, they're being called by different genus names by the group that, that found them. And, you know, they, they prep them and they look really nice, but no, no actual scientific study or anything has been done. They're trying to sell this block for what I've heard at least uh, for $9 million. And that's really exceptional. And you know, paleontology is a relatively cheap science. So for nine million dollars, and I, you know, our curator at a Natural History Museum of Utah did a little calculation on this, that could fund the department for about two hundred and fifty years. So, if you think if you had nine million dollars to burn, you know, which most museums don't, um, and you're thinking about what do I do with this, it'd be much better put into field and lab studies where you can get lots and lots of dinosaurs from many places around the world over many, many years, rather than just basically blow it on these two specimens. So that's why I like I, you know, harp on this um, quite a bit, much to the frustration of some commercial collectors. But you know, I think it's really important that these bones go into a um, you know repository that, that that's public, where you know even if it's not going out on display, um, you know the science from that is is being used to uh, you know further our understanding of what dinosaurs were like. Going to museum displays and form books, you know, sometimes be put on on display. Whereas a lot of these commercially collected specimens, they might not ever see display, or you know they'll go into private hands. Lots of people uh, just you know have fossils on their own ranch land that they just sell on eBay to, you know, whoever, and those are totally lost uh, forever, because the uh, United States actually has very relatively lax uh, fossil laws. So other countries like in Mongolia or China or in Argentina, it's relatively strictly regulated. You, know, you need to you know, have the proper permits, go to the proper authorities. Uh, the fossils need to um, you know, eventually come back so they can be on long-term loan for people to study them, but they need to eventually come back to the country of origin because they're the natural history heritage. Um, in the U.S., if you're a rancher and you find fossils on your land, you can basically just dig them up, prep them in your basement, and sell them on eBay for whatever anyone's willing to pay for them. They could go anywhere. Uh, and it's kind of hard to put the you know cat back in, in the bag in, in terms of that. You know, There's a lot of anti-government sentiment, anti-regulation sentiment, and, and that sort of thing surrounding it. But the fortunate thing is that there are many, many fossils, many on uh, you know public lands that uh, you know are continuing to you know in inform our, our understanding of uh, what these animals are actually like. I, I just wanted to pick up on a minute ago you uh, discussed, well, you mentioned the Bone Wars, and you yeah. talk about that quite a lot in your new book, so maybe this is a good point for you to uh, tell us about the Bone Wars and also your, your new book, My Beloved Brontosaurus. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you for, for mentioning the book. And I was like, yeah, that's it right there, yes. Um, <laughs> this is my special uh, sign copy with a, a little Brian Switek uh, illustration and everything. Yeah, look at that. 
<laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's an original. I don't think you can get much for it, but all the same. Yeah, I know. Wait, that's that's what I'm asking. Yeah. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> <laughs> One viewer might be interested in bidding on it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, so, th so the book, My Beloved Brontosaurus, is all about, you know, why the uh, dinosaurs I grew up with, the slow, sluggish, drab, swamp-bound idiots, basically have turned into these brightly colored, feathery, you know, very complex and active uh, dinosaurs. So why Brontosaurus doesn't exist anymore. And in its place, we have, you know, uh, Apatosaurus, very different bearing, very different sort of, um, you know, looking animal and the way it behaved is a lot more complex. How that change happened, using the cultural tension between the old dinosaurs and the new to get at some of the new science, so what we can really know about you know, what they sounded like, how they made it, what colors they might have been, whether they were social or not. All these persistent questions about dinosaur lives. And uh, you know, a lot of new stuff, or at least um, you know, sort of our continuing legacy, comes out of the Bone Wars, these two paleontologists who uh, battled each other you know, uh, tooth and claw o over who's going to be you know, North America's premier vertebrate paleontologist. So you had Edward Drinker Cope, who was based out of Philadelphia, and Othniel Charles Charles Marsh, who was based out of uh, the uh, Yale Peabody Museum in New Haven, Connecticut. The museum was actually made for him by his rich uncle Peabody uh, to give him a job. And uh, yeah, it would be pretty sweet to get that gig, huh? <laughs> um, so both of them, uh, you know, had gone to Europe to actually uh, to learn about paleontology and geology because there's no programs in the United States at that time. Um, you know, met each other, became friends very briefly, and then got into this really intense competition where, um, you know, they would do uh, everything they could to be the first to name uh, new dinosaur, fossil mammal, other sort of prehistoric like species, and become the major paleontologist in North America. So, um, you know, some of their rivalry has been overplayed a little bit as far as, you know, they didn't actively destroy each other's field sites, but they, they try and get, like, the best prospectors. They try and get the best access. Sometimes they visit each other's field camps and there are all these sort of, like, cryptic notes written on that day. Uh, you know, so they're treated as spies almost, you know, when people from opposing camps would come and visit field sites. And really they were working in the same sorts of formations often, so they were naming uh, the same animals over and over again. And this is in the days when we didn't really know a whole lot about dinosaurs still. So any fragment of a skeleton, not even a whole bone, any fragment that seemed significant, that could justify a new name. So they, you know, get on the telegraph and actually telegraph in their descriptions in these brief notes to publish them as fast as possible to beat the other guy into print. And they do really dickish things like there's this dinosaur um, that Cope named Laylaps. We now know this is a Tyrannosaur from the, uh, about, you know, 66 million year old deposits of New Jersey. At the time, he didn't know the age. He just knew he had this carnivorous dinosaur named it Laylaps. Is where I get the name of my blog from. Well, it turns out that Laylaps, uh, the name was preoccupied by, I think, an owl mite of some kind. So, <laughs> what Marsh did, knowing that you're know, finding this out, he renamed the animal in a footnote of a description of another dinosaur, and he renamed it Dryptosaurus. So it's like not even like a full paper or taxonomy. In a footnote, he renames his rivals like one of his most favorite and distinctive discoveries. And that's like the level of just immaturity and interpersonal evil that was going on between <laughs> these guys. I like that an insect featured highly in that story. This is a good story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, there, as I uh, mentioned later in the book, I mean, uh, you know, obviously there are lots of insects and uh, things in, in, in the age of dinosaurs, and you know, including, uh, I think they were announced last year, some rather large, like inch-long, 114 million-year-old fleas that have mouth parts that seem so formidable that you know the researchers who described them couldn't imagine them doing anything else except feeding on dinosaurs or other sort of tough-skinned uh, you know, organisms. And these weren't fleas that could jump, but the sort of scurried out from the undergrowth and ambushed you know, whatever dinosaur is passing by, you know, suck some blood, and then run back uh, <laughs> in, in, into the forest. Gorilla fleas, yes. but not that kind of gorilla. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in the beginning of your book, you talk a little bit about how like paleontology is a really dynamic discipline and people are making discoveries all the time and mm -hmm. like even the most recent exhibition is going to be outdated by the time that, it, that mm -hmm. it goes public and everything. So as I was reading this, I was wondering, like, was there like one thing that you ran into and that you thought, okay, people really need, about, need to know about this or, you know, a misconception that you thought, like, what was like, was there a, a motivator that made you put your effort into writing this book and making it available now? 
Yeah, there was one particular answer. I mean, first of all, you know, dinosaurs are fucking awesome. Everyone should know more about dinosaurs. <laughs> but beyond that, beyond my personal conceit, um, it was in the uh, summer of 2010. So this is a little bit before uh, my first book came out, and I was thinking about what to do next. And right before I left for a field experience or a field camp uh, that was in uh, Wyoming looking for uh, late Cretaceous dinosaurs, um, two paleontologists, John Scanella and Jack Horner from the Museum of the Rockies, came out with this paper saying that the dinosaur that we'd always called Taurosaurus, this animal that has three horns, relatively large-bodied, beaked herbivore, two holes in its frill, um, is actually the mature form of Triceratops. So instead of being two distinct dinosaur genera that lived alongside each other, you know, one is the adult and the other form that we'd always assume was an adult is, was, uh, you know, a subadult or a bit younger. Um, but because Triceratops was named first, that name would have priority. So all the Taurosaurus specimens that we knew of would get relabeled Triceratops if they were correct. Journalists got entirely backwards. And they said, you know, Triceratops is being destroyed. They're taking it away. And there was a limerick on uh, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me uh, saying there's no such thing as Triceratops. There's a lot of outrage. I think my favorite expression of disbelief and anger was a uh, variation of the uh, Three Wolf Moon shirt where someone had Pluto and Triceratops, or Triceratops howling at Pluto uh, on this T-shirt. I don't think it's a real, I think it's just an image. I would have bought that T-shirt if it actually existed. But in any case, it took, you know, a number of weeks just to get sort of corrected. I, I wrote about this multiple times and eventually, you know, word got through that, you know, Triceratops isn't going anywhere. If any dinosaur is, it's probably Taurosaurus or one that nobody talked about that was involved in the paper called Natoceratops. You know, diehard paleo fans of those dinosaurs could be disappointed, but Triceratops was safe. I thought, well, why, um, why did this happen? It was such a simple mistake that caused all this outrage and indignation over a dinosaur being taken away, where even if that had happened, even if, let's say, Triceratops was named second and you know, the name was being taken, the animal still exists, the animal still there, and we learned something new about its biology and how it grew up and how it evolved. You know, isn't that a wonderful thing? But instead, you know, people wanted to cling so tightly to their most favorite childhood dinosaur that they didn't want to accept uh, how science was changing you know these animals so to me that that sort of uh, became a, you know even though brontosaurus you know sort of this uh, dinosaur that we now properly call patasaurus you know similar sort of thing you know multiple specimens were named a patasaurus turned out to be named first and be you know cover all these other uh, species that were named you know um, that became the mascot later, but the whole Triceratops Taurosaurus thing is what inspired this. Is sort of why does this tension exist between the dinosaurs we love the most and the really awesome dinosaurs that science is continuing to bring to life as we learn more about them? I gotta say, you know, your book actually, it was brilliant at taking me back to my childhood too, because I felt the same way that you did describing it in the book and talking about how dinosaurs were to you as a kid, even though I eventually fell off dinosaurs. Sorry, but um, <laughs> but I did I just actually have this image that. of you on the back of some kind of dinosaur just <laughs> sliding off. <laughs> Maybe at the Creation Museum you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there we go. Uh, <laughs> I provide today's ridiculous image. Excellent. Oh, uh, we'll provide the image later. Don't worry. Well, thank you for the compliments. You were about to say something else. I'm sorry, I, I cut you off. Uh, it's okay. I was, I was just going to say that following from what you were saying, there are more than a few points in the book where there is this, <clears throat> this palpable tension between what the media is reporting and, you know, what's actually true. <laughs> is, this, is this a really common thing? Is there this, like, really... Because we have it in all branches of science, right? You know, yeah. the journalists can't get anything right. But <laughs> Oops, sorry. Uh, but do you see that more so with paleontology, do you think? Or? Uh, I think it's symptomatic... Uh, well, really, yeah, I think it's a symptom of all kinds of science reporting, basically, that this is not unique to paleontology, mostly because we uh, lack experts and we lack dedicated science desks and we lack people who really know their beat. Uh, a lot of um, reporting that you're likely to see, and unfortunately, a lot of reporting that gets very widely shared, uh, things that show up on live science that then go to um, you know Yahoo and MSN and Fox and elsewhere, the things that get syndicated are written by uh, non-specialists who don't really know the field, don't really know the background, don't often know who to talk to about um, recent discoveries to get another perspective. And uh, you know, sometimes we'll fall also for um, BS that 
researchers put out themselves. I mean, it's not like a problem with the journalists. They're, you know, scientists who, you know, overhype and, uh, you know, push uh, their their findings or what they think are their findings, you know, further than, than they should. So I think it's, you know, the, the tension they see in paleontology between discoveries being made and how they get reported or uh, get blown up to a certain degree, that's uh, really a common pattern in, in all science reporting and uh, you know goes to sort of the, the heart of the main problems that we have is how do we develop um, you know better experts better commentators better journalists and, and reporters I mean that's one of the reasons why I'm able to do what I do for a living not everything I do is journalism but the reason I'm able to pitch journalistic articles to places like Nature News or National Geographic or elsewhere is because I made myself basically into an expert and people know that I know the beat like um, this was just a blog post but um, last week there was a discovery of a, a Triceratops bone bed that was being widely reported and saying, okay, you know, as the most complete skeletons and they all died together, so this is a social group, and uh, you know, a tyrannosaur came and ate them all. The bones aren't even totally out of the ground yet, and the whole social group thing. There's a paper in 2009 that suggested the same thing from another bone bed, so it wasn't as totally unique as was thought. Their skeletons are just as complete known elsewhere. So really, yeah, cool. We have more Triceratops skeletons, but beyond that, there really wasn't anything more to say. And I, you know, wrote a response um, you know, to that, and that's a relatively, you know, my Thing. No one's going to live or die because you know someone overhyped a Triceratops bone bed. At least I hope not. But if that's one of the reasons why I kind of harp on this this quite often, because if we're that careless about something that's just fun and doesn't even matter, like I hate to think what's going on in like medical reporting or you know reporting about vaccines or you know things that you know global climate change things that actually matter, uh, where you know, we have basically inexpert reporters uh, who are willing to go this way or that, depending on what you know the latest paper is, and they don't have the context or the background to really say, no, this is good, or this is bullshit, or even just to know when not to report a story. There are plenty of stories that just should not be stories. That, you know, this really doesn't you know, doesn't matter or isn't newsworthy or needs to be attached to something else to have importance uh, or is just hype. Um, so, yeah, I, I think uh, what I see in paleontology is, is uh, really actually part of a widespread problem with science journalism. See, that that kind of feels, it feels like there is something special about paleontology in that regard, though. I mean, you, you do mention it at a couple points in the book mm -hmm. where, you know, it's like Pluto, where they change, you know, the status of the planet and everybody's up in arms. I mm -hmm. mean, the, the International Committee on the Taxonomy of Viruses could rename pretty much half of the viruses. Nobody would <laughs> give a crap. But, That's you true. know, if somebody tries to touch a triceratops and there's mm -hmm. t-shirts. You know. Well, I think... Uh, for that reason, in terms of, in, in that respect, I mean, it's because dinosaurs have a privileged place in, in our childhood, just like learning the, the solar system. And, you know, some of these animals, they become a benchmark by which we understand prehistory. So if you take away Pluto, you know, you need to remind yourself, okay, well, how many planets are in the solar system again? Or if you take away Brontosaurus, okay, well, if that didn't exist, then <laughs> what about all these other ones? And so you, you know, become unmoored, the sort of landmark that you had to understand you know, the past or space or something else is suddenly gone and people feel very uncomfortable about that. And the reason why it's there in the first place is because, uh, you know, sort of learning about space, learning about prehistory and about dinosaurs is a common part of, uh, you know, our childhood. If nobody cared about dinosaurs, if, if a dinosaur phase wasn't an expected part of um, childhood, instead we had a virus phase or an insect phase or something like that, <laughs> um, then you know no one would care about the Triceratops thing, but it's because we encounter these animals, and there are for many of us our introduction to science. You know, it's our introduction to you know concepts and you know um, you know aspects of nature that we never knew before, and then we sort of wander away from them, and then when we come back and they're totally different, we almost feel sort of betrayed. So uh, it that is more of a result of our familiarity with them when when we're young, and uh, then you know when we come back we don't recognize them. Wow, so our one one of our viewers, Sam, has got a comment here that I'm going to throw up on the screen and then read out, and it's really long, and hopefully he's not saying okay. anything offensive. So, Sam asks, why do you think the public have fallen so much in love with the scientific <laughs> names for dinosaurs, whereas they couldn't give two shits about extent species scientific names, even the charismatic ones? Conversely, why don't we see common names for dinosaur used among the general public? Why don't we grow up learning Stegosaurus to be the spike-tailed dinosaur, etc.? And then he's just bitter about spiders. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I couldn't say about the spiders, but uh, I think that's partially because this, those are the only names that we have. For di- and partially, I mean, dinosaur names are fantastic. I mean, Tyrannosaurus Rex, that has to be one of the best names ever <laughs> coined, ever. It really is. You know, that that's why, you know, even though dinosaurs are supposedly larger, more ferocious, or, or weirder have been found, that's why Tyrannosaurus Rex, after over a century, still remains, I think, you know, the world's most favorite dinosaur, and uh, part of it is that there, are, there weren't common names for this. They'd be, you know, name this and introduce to the public in, in using their, uh, you know, Greek and Latin rooted names, and, you know, like when newspapers would run articles, they wouldn't just say, you know, the big meat eating one, they'd use the actual name. So I guess in a way it became just like a cultural sort of thing. This is what we call these dinosaurs, but if you look at um, more recent prehistoric animals, if you look at sort of, you know, Pleistocene animals, which are extinct, they're fossil, we don't say, uh, Mammut Americanum, we say the American Mastodon, or uh, we don't say you know, Mammuthus, we say you know uh, Willy Mammoth, and you know we say Shasta Ground Sloth and Saber Tooth Cat, and you know occasionally you'll hear Smilodon or something. But um, in general, you know they're they're a little bit closer, a little more familiar to us. They have common names partially because they resemble animals that we have around us um, today. Whereas dinosaurs, there's there's nothing. Quite like that. I mean, we've got birds, we've got living dinosaurs, but you know that's a relatively new thing. I think it just became a matter of, you know, these are the names that they've got, and a lot of them were very relatively simple and very evocative. There are a few that I can't really pronounce with ease, but a lot of the early ones, like Stegosaurus or Triceratops or Tyrannosaurus or Diplodocus, they're all relatively easily pronounceable, and they often go to the to the heart of what these animals. There's something of, of the the animal spirit in them. Uh, so yeah, I I think. Uh, yeah, that's a place where you know science has kind of um, won out. You know, uh, and I'm not sure. You know, to me, it doesn't really matter that the public doesn't know the scientific names of uh, modern animals. I mean, if you're a birder, or if you're really concerned about you know, sort of, um, you know, sort of field guides and sort of really knowing what you're looking at, yes, it's important to know you know the, the scientific names. But in general, um, it's it, I'm. Even if, if people didn't know dinosaur names and just said it's the dome-headed one, or it's the really sharp tooth one, like I wouldn't be head desking so much. It matters more to me that science are, are, are a way, or dinosaurs are a way to get people into science and learning about some concepts. If they know a name or can't pronounce it or get the name wrong, which I often hear, which often happens, I'm not especially bothered by that aspect. I mean, we don't, might all like that to happen. It you know, might be a, like a watermark for you know, public understanding or appreciation of, of science, but uh, I think there are certainly bigger fish to fry when it comes to uh, science edu- education in, the, in our country. So in an example of uh, science possibly not winning out, uh, yeah. I saw recently when Jurassic Park 4 was announced and the director said there would be no feathers, then you're mm-hmm. leading the charge to uh, try and get them back on the, back on the menu. So can you... Uh, That's right. State, state your position. <laughs> oh, fe- feathers for all is, is my position. <laughs> um, so, I mean, that, that's the science. So one of the reasons why, I mean, beyond just being a good adventure yarn and having really good special effects, that the first Jurassic Park was so successful is because it melded um, new science, sort of a new image of dinosaurs that had never been seen before on film, you know, animals that were moving much faster, were intelligent, you know, had their tails lifted up off the ground. Um, nothing like that had ever been seen before, so new science melded with the best special effects that Hollywood could muster to create this new imagery of dinosaurs. And I think that really, um, for the fourth film, it'd be really helpful if they continued on in in that sort of uh, tradition, you know, bring dinosaurs to life with the best that we know about how they actually lived. And it was also give them an opportunity to, uh, you know, see dinosaurs as never before. So imagine something like Therizinosaurus. So this is an animal about the size of a Tyrannosaurus rex. And we use Tyrannosaurus rex as our template here. Shrink down the head into this tiny little thing that could fit in your arms, more or less. Has a beak on it, a long slender neck, a tubby body with a big gut, basically. Long arms with Freddy Krueger claws at the end of it. And cover the whole thing with fuzzy feathers. Nothing like that has ever been seen on film Ever and yes, it might look a little bit silly or something else, but I think that'd be a great way to really shock audiences and give them something that's never ever been seen uh, before. And it'd be a great way to do a bit of science outreach. I mean, people do watch these films and they do believe what they're seeing in these films has some kind of scientific merit or scientific basis. After all, they make a big deal about bringing paleontologists like Jack Horner on as advisors. So basically, if we're going to be helping you bring these things to life, 
the least that Colin Trevorrow and you know other Jurassic Park producers and everyone's can do is you know maybe bring dinosaurs out of the early 90s and maybe try and get them you know a little bit uh, you know more accurate. Feathers will not make them stupid. That's the thing that I hear most often. It's like oh they're just going to look dumb or that's outside the canon of the film. It's like the, the films like disregard their own canon anyway whenever it's convenient. <laughs> it's not an argument. It's like that, I think most of the pushback I got were from Jurassic Park like forum fanboys who were just like, well in the book they use frog DNA and that could explain the lack of feathers. And it's just like they had bristly feathers on the top of their heads in the last one. They looked really dumb because they didn't commit to feathers. Just like they're already <laughs> changing the dinosaurs to try and like throw us a bone if you will and they're screwing up. So you might as well just try and get this right. <laughs> I am totally on board. I think that a dinosaur splattered with blood covered in feathers would be absolutely horrifying, no matter well, whether yeah. it looks like a chicken or a tyrannosaur. So. Well, imagine a velociraptor, which we know had feathers from these little quill knobs on its arms, you know, sort of preening blood off its feathers after a kill. I mean, that would be absolutely terrifying. Yeah. You know, it, it goes back to what you know Alan Grant said in the first one, because if you watch the first movie again, it's incredibly progressive in terms of the bird-dinosaur connection. Alan Grant, like, half the movie, like, most of his lines seem to be about birds being dinosaurs, and early on he says, you know, I bet you'll never look at birds the same way again. It's like, well, I think that's absolutely true. If they can make a really terrifying feathery velociraptor, uh, you know, people might be running from pigeons, I don't know. But still be, <laughs> still be scary. It's still be scary. <laughs> That would be definitely scary. So we got to wrap it up now. We're re- running out of time, but uh, before we go, is what's next for for Laylapse and uh, and Bookwise? You got anything on the, the horizon that you're writing up? Uh, well, I have a couple uh, book ideas. I've actually had several ideas for the next book that have all kind of fizzled or turned into different projects. I was actually just on my phone, uh, just on the phone with my editor uh, about the next one. Not totally sure what's going to be yet, but. Um, I hope to have that nailed down soon. In terms of lay laps and blogging, um, I'm going to do a little write-up of my experience uh, in in the field at uh, Inksville and at the Cleveland Lloyd Quarry. And as I go to various other field sites throughout the summer, uh, you know, I've got uh, expeditions at to uh, you know, New Mexico and Southern Utah, you know, possibly Montana and elsewhere. As I come back from my various journeys, I'll be sharing uh, sort of updates in the field to show people what it's really like to go out, you know, uh, digging dinosaurs. The sort of joys and frustrations of field work. So uh, you can certainly keep an eye out for that on uh, my Laylapse blog at National Geographic. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for joining us today on uh, episode 33 of Breaking Bio. For anybody at home that's listening, you can find us at breakingbio.com or on Twitter at Breaking Bio. And hopefully you'll join us next week when we have a new and exciting guest with probably less blood and gore. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me. <laughs>